Thing in. Hey guys, and welcome to the Garage Athlete Show. Uh, we're on episode 56, and I'm joined tonight by the wonderful Daniel Fraser and Rachel Smith. I think it's the first time all three of us have been on a podcast in quite a while. Um, so yeah, we haven't yeah. really planned anything today. We're just going to shoot the shit and try to keep it around the hour mark. Um, as me and me and Rachel like to go to run over our, our time slots quite a lot. So, how are you, Dan? Obviously, we missed you last week. I think you were doing some some drumming. Um, yeah, I was uh, trying to get back into that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. how's that no, going? Good. Yeah, good fun. I bloody love it. It's my drumming is my passions. Uh, it's really <laughs> good fun. Uh, nice to play again. I played a lot when I was younger. I haven't played for like ten years or so, so I started picking up the sticks again. Um, that is now my new thing I do on a, like once a week or so. So yeah. yeah, absolutely loving it. It is wonderful. I am balls deep into it. I just want to drum. That's the only thing I want to do in my life. But uh, no, it's good fun, man. It's, it's a lot, of, say a lot it's of fun. Probably good to have some interests that are outside of, I think a lot of fitness people, especially, they don't have any other hobbies. And when it becomes your career, it can make you like very one track minded and very insular because you don't have anything that takes you away from it. Like what we do in our spare time is all also what we coach people to do it as a job. It can be quite, um, especially because we train at home as well. Um, you can find it's quite isolating. So do you, do you drum in a group? Are you going to try to get back into a group or is it literally you just go around somebody's house who's got a, a drum kit that's so funny when you say group you totally sound like yeah like a, like, like someone talk to a young person like do you do drum in a group is, is that something you do in, in a nice group uh in a band yeah uh, uh i'm actually gonna go audition for a band tomorrow we're gonna play some nice. 80s kind of music so i'm gonna play some van Halen, guns and roses that kind of stuff so that should be fun uh at the moment she's been on my own um but yeah that's where is the first time i've played with people for about yeah, 10, probably even 15 years, actually. A very long time since I've played with other people. So I'm pretty excited about that. So, yeah, that is pretty cool. And then I'm going to bring some of my stuff. And then the dream is to build a cabin in the back garden. I'll go drumming because the garage is a gym. And I'll probably keep it a gym. So I want to build a log cabin in the back garden and go drumming there and annoy the neighbours. That's new in life. Sounds very manly. Um... It's fucking cool as well. <laughs> And how are you, Ray? A bit Maddie loves that. Like stuck in the house with all the kids, and Dan's like, "Fuck you! Garage is mine. Garden is mine. You stay Everything in the house." Is mine. Well, it's kind of like the house is yours. Yeah, uh, exactly. You can well, you can decorate. You can. I'm already in trouble because I've fucking taken the uh, uh, what do you call it? The I don't even know what's called the washing machine and the dryer out of the garage because I was like, I need more space for gym kit. Come on, I work from home, I train people here, it needs to be professional, I need to have the floor space. And, and then yesterday she was like, So, uh, Dan, you know, you moved the uh, washing machine out of the garage. I'm like, Yeah, 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 you know, gym, gym. She's like, yeah, So, putting a drum kit there because I put my electric drum kit there at the moment. She was like, Yeah, that's really like, you know, professional and your clients are going to use that, those aren't they? I was like, well, that's that's different though. That, that's like a completely different thing. It was like, oh fuck, I shot myself in the foot there, didn't I? So the next option is to obviously buy a log cabin in the back. And then well, I've, told, I've already told her when the, all the girls grow up, we're gonna have a drum circle in the playroom and we're all gonna play in here together. And then that's why it's important we have a house of music. I think that's a good show. So we we've got a house of dance here because Willow is starting oh, baby dance. ballet. Yes, um, and I've said because she's a quarter black, she's going to have rhythm. So, like, that's just that's fine. Um, there you go. And Rach, how's your move going? We're, any more flooring down? Have you? I can. We can see your branding in the background. Your awesome logo going branding on. Head. So, um, flooring is in progress. There's flooring covering everything. It's not, not fitted, fitted, but um, yeah, it's, it's there. Wait, it's it a, I'm, cool. I'm kind of giving myself like another week to get everything sorted in here like it's a mess but it's not a usable mess and then after next week I'll be back into being able to train myself as well because there's no point like this is like physically demanding stuff moving everything still recovering yeah. from COVID and all that so I was like cool let's give me a chance to just play around with what I want to do set a few new goals 
um, and then just kind of get my food back into a decent place because I still can't smell or taste anything. So wow. like, it's so shit. Like I, I love food and I love coffee and I love steak and I, there's nothing. Like everything is just hot, cold, salt, and, like salt or sweet, but there's no flavor. And it's like, oh, this is hot, crunchy food. This is cold, <laughs> smooth food. Like, how shit is that? It's so bad. Yeah, it's um, mad, mad, um, that. Yeah. yeah. That sounds bad. It's mad, not her sense of taste as well. I, I, think it's, I think it's coming back, but it's definitely changed. It's not mm. the same as what it was. She's tasting things differently. Um, but yeah, she lost her taste there uh, for quite a while, actually. Um, but it's coming mm. back slowly. But yeah, well, it does take time, yeah. Yeah, I think everyone has said Joshua and Willow is now double jabbed in that. Well, I think Ben's 17, so he's got the one vaccination. Because I don't think, because you guys have had it now, you get like a pass, don't you? Like you don't have to have the vaccine. You can get a, what do you call it, COVID pass, which is the same as if you've been jabbed. Um, so you could, yeah, you, if you go, if you download the NA, did you get a test done to say that you were positive? Yeah, because you get uh, it's yes. like the um, antibody thing, isn't it? And it's yep, like yep. if you improve that, you've kind of had it or you've got the vaccination. It's kind of similar type of thing. So if you did a PCR test and that's linked to your NHS account, yeah. you can go onto the different NHS app, not the COVID app, uh, just the different one. And you can download something that says because they're bringing in those the passes. So like if you want to go out to a nightclub, you're going to have to have this past thing if you want to go abroad you've got to have this thing to say you've either had covid have had been vaccinated or um you're exempt for whatever reason um which i don't know how i feel about like i i get it i get why they're kind of doing it but it does it is a little bit scary how much like so like i'm going to the arnold classic in october and they released all the tickets. They've sold thousands of tickets. And then they've, they've just decided, right, you now need to have your COVID passport to be able to get in. So obviously the fitness industry, like you see got a lot of people kind of in this sort of sector that are like, I'm not getting the vaccine. It's untested. I'll just, I'll let my um, immune system kind of like handle it so they're all the people that bought the tickets and now they're being like well well when we bought the ticket this wasn't a condition i want my money back and arnold have gone no you can't have your money back you can try and sell it on you can put it on Ticketmaster and try and sell it on but when we're not giving you refunds so a lot of people are upset about that wow yeah that's quite something isn't it they definitely changed the terms i mean yeah i mean Something I've always been kind of like feeling like I've been anti the passport kind of stuff. I mean, I am double jabbed and I do believe we should get the vaccine. But yeah, something about the, the vaccine passports tickles me. But then again, yeah. like my actions have kind of aligned to that anyway. So maybe yeah. I should go along with that, I suppose. I, I don't know. It's um, I know Arnold's ruffled a lot of feathers recently with his comments. It was like, you tell Americans about freedom, you know, talk about freedom oh, yeah. Americans and oh. they just fucking burn your bridges straight there, straight away like I think I guess I know what he was talking about I guess as British people we kind of hear that and be like mm, okay whereas you know America's whereas talking about freedoms yeah. and they're like right that's he's a freaking Nazi let's destroy him and all that <laughs> <laughs> but we're not saying Cameron Cameron burns his pictures <sighs> and we're like I'm never going to an Arnold thing again yeah, um, mate, you fucking played on him with the film as well. Like, it's just like, yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I think a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon with that kind of stuff. Um, I know it's a, you know, Amer Americans are Americans, and I don't know if you've ever spoken to them about you know, their opinions on guns and stuff like that. But you get, you get, you get, to come, you get into very heated conversations very quickly. <laughs> I and remember just... speaking to an American about guns, and he said, "Well." what if somebody breaks into your house with an axe? How are you going to defend your family? And I was just like, well, I live in a society where it's not a normal state of affairs for somebody to break into my house with an axe. The fact that you're having to think about that says to me that violence is part of your world. Like, I don't know about you, but yeah. a home invasion isn't like something I, I worry about. Like, it's, mm -hmm. I know they happen, but... It's probably it's very rare, I think, in this country. I think it's 
I think in America where there are more guns, that's probably where you get more home invasions because people have got a gun, so they feel like they can go and rob somebody with an offensive weapon. But yeah, I, I know what you mean about that. You, you get into a very circular argument when you're going down that line. Yeah, it's like when you argue with someone on the internet, you're never arguing to change someone's mind. You're arguing for what people see in the comments. Um, yeah. That's what you're arguing about. Like You're arguing to get your point across. I remember we were... Um, we were on a plane and just talking about gun stuff and it basically got pretty pretty full on and I was like I think we messed up this conversation because it's it's not going anywhere and it's like you're clearly a freaking right wing maniac so let's just let's just stop there before it <laughs> gets a bit too I mean it's not going to get physical or anything but it's just like whoa like it, it's a it's a well it's a it's somewhere I wouldn't really want to ever live I remember thinking you know i love american culture and you know it's it, all my like loads of my favorite music's tvs bands you know films all that kind of stuff is all american but from visiting there i was like oh no I, I wouldn't want to be here just just you get a feeling it's it's, it's it's not for you but um as a kid i thought it was where i wanted to live but uh nah we're all good <sighs> sorry right. yeah i was talking to um, Dan, just before you got on about like all my clothes at the moment, because I'm what 13 kilos lighter than I normally sit. Like everything looks like it's absolutely drowning me at the moment. The curse of uh, natural bodybuilding. Like when be just before I moved back down here, so I still had stuff in bags from like six years ago when I was like a size, like my like smaller size, like a size six, and I was like what the fuck is this? Um, so yeah, that, that all went to um, charity because yeah, that I won't be going back into that. But um, it's, I think for females, it's like you, it's having, you need two completely separate wardrobes because this is, you're going to be like, what the hell? But like, even from an underwear perspective, like it doesn't sit against your body. So if you're wearing like small underwear, like it's got nothing to go on because you just kind of bone. Because like females who train, obviously you've got, you don't carry fat on like your hips or um, like when your glutes are shredded. It's like there's nowhere for like underwear to sit. So um, I, I remember even just like having like a weird tiny underwear on thing and like, uh, yeah. It, but you don't have that worry. It's all right, done. Well, it's interesting actually because um, I've, I've got to wear a suit tomorrow and I don't wear suits very often. So we bought one, me a new one, again, when I was peak bulk. So my waist was like 32. Now I had an old suit, and when I say old, like this is a suit I wore when I was like 16, 17, which is probably a similar size to kind of I am now. And I've like dug it out. So the jacket just about fits, but the trousers, I think we chucked them out. Um, just because I was like, I'll never get into a, a 28 waist again so why are these even in here i'll just chuck those out whereas actually that would have been perfect for me to wear tomorrow but yeah i've now got to try and dash around <laughs> somewhere to find some cheap like school kids pants because i'll only fit into like children's clothes at the moment so <laughs> they, they used to be like in in, like an aspiration like I remember one of my things I was like yeah I can buy kids clothes and I'm like why the hell is a grown adult do I think it's a good idea to want to don't fit in children's clothes like don't pay that yeah but it's just <laughs> like it, it, isn't that just like a re it was like when we're talking the other day about like having a number on a scale and stuff like mm -hmm. that and you just think wow but it's it's part of like learning and like actually trying things out yourself to then go yeah is that a healthy mindset? Is that a healthy way to go? Is it necessary for a goal at the time? Or am I just a fucking idiot? Probably the latter. I think it's interesting because we were saying about like um, dieting and dieting mindset. So obviously I'm competing in just over two weeks and I totaled it up that. So I started my diet in February. I think early February, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. So by the time that I do my final show, I will have been dieting for 10 months. Like that's a ridiculous amount of time to be in a calorie deficit. Um, 
especially with no like structured diet breaks and stuff in there. Now, how I've run this is not how I would run it for a client because the goal is completely different. Like I'd say the first, I'm trying to think of the number. I'm trying to get the right numbers now. The first like six to eight kilos was fairly comfortable. I've run dieting phases before. We're averaging about a pound a week. Some weeks it'd be faster. Some weeks it'd be slower. Um, food was relatively high. Like my body just kind of dropped down to the like 75, 74 kilos mark relatively easy. It's been these last like four or five kilos where we've really had to dig in, had to throw cardio in there, had to pull food out, had to do all these how use all the tools in the toolbox to really kind of like drive things forward. And I think a mistake a lot of people make when they go into a dieting phase is, as I said, like I didn't even throw cardio in really. I think I had one session of cardio per week, like right up until I'd lost like six or seven kilos. Whereas a lot of people, they need to lose a kilo and they start doing five bouts of cardio a week. And it's just like, mm-hmm it's one of those things where cardio is not the be all and end all it's saying it's not the drive of fat loss man like look no. at anyone that's got an incredible if it's right I, I was thinking about this earlier today like it waits through research you what do you call it, anecdotal research as in like people you've worked with things you've seen cardio is not the driver of body composition change as in uh what i mean by that is as in a recomp as in phys- physical change you know transformations cardio is not the driver of that if anything cardio can hinder it and we've seen it time and time again it's, it's, it's i guess it's about what i thought it was already over but apparently not like you know we've got say someone like you bodybuilder i don't know training is where like your training for fat loss compared to your muscle gain is pretty similar you'll probably have a few more sets to to get the most amount of from your hypertrophy phases you have a few more sets but you know when you're cutting you'll probably drop a, a couple of sets but it's not that much different to what you do um year round but the the change comes from you know getting your background steps in your, your weight and your diet but i think people still think they can sweat their way to greater fat loss gains and it's like you just hear every time it just doesn't work or it, it does work temporarily and it can work but it's kind of like you burn out can you yeah can you keep lifting weights for the next 10 years like three to four times a week i'm thinking i'm pretty sure you could i'm pretty sure we have done right like it's yeah uh, yeah can you run you know more miles pound the pavement every day do extra amounts of cardio every day you know four or five times a week for the next 10 years it's like cool if you can but most people no not not really and from what you're getting from the running and the you know the extreme cardio and all that is just potential a bit of losing some fat you're probably going to lose some muscle mass as well so weight loss is going to happen but in terms of that body transformation it's not really going to do it and it's bloody hard to keep up i mean like if you like running if that's what your thing is go running you know no problem yeah, absolutely great you smash that maybe do some ways to support that but if your goal is to drop fat look great naked you know be a bit more jacked um you know carry muscle in the right areas it's, it's not the way to go and it's yeah um, it's about i think we'll have for forever i guess in the fitness industry i guess we don't really do ourselves any favors as well as coaches sometimes with the stuff you know workouts and stuff like me and rachel have done a lot of group training things and they were you know this kind of group training stuff was like i don't know if you've ever used a my zone belt yeah i used that it's almost and it's almost like you know for you you know it has a tool and it's good to do but people almost become obsessed like it's like yeah i'm just getting maps just getting the my zone to the yeah. point that they would miss a uh, a strength class a resistance training class where they're getting tons of stuff going on after the session loads of background stuff and you know improved health improved posture improved muscle tone all that kind of stuff purely because it wasn't getting them the meps they wanted and you also notice that say for example if their my zone has a fault or they forget it they don't want to do the workout because it's no, like, what's, what's the point yeah. in doing it i'm not getting any maps for it and it's It's one of those things like the gamification of exercise. They've done a lot of studies on it. The gamification of exercise works really, really well in the short term to get people to adhere to an exercise program. 
However, you then have to have something that builds on top of that to explain to them that it's not the points that you're getting that's worth it. It's the results and the body that's happening. And that would happen regardless of whether you're tracking or, or not. It's the same sort of thing as happened in the first challenge when we set like prizes for the people who did well. The people that like fell off and had a bad week then just stopped because it was like, oh, well, there's no point in carrying on because I've missed out on that prize because I've had a bad week. Whereas we know as coaches, like, the prize is the physique that you get at the end and the results that you get at the end. And that's one of the reasons why we, we took away that element kind of like out of it, just because I think sometimes the gamification, the competition, things like that can take away from what essentially is the important part, which is the, the things that happen while you're doing it, the changes physio physiologically, mentally, and then the results that you kind of get at the end as well. I think it's like the mindset thing, like it's a whole Amazon Prime mindset, whereas like people are still after quick fixes, short fixes, like everything's short term without longevity and consistency and no education behind it. And like I've trained at some amazing facilities, but they still use some element of like my zone and tracking like that, but they don't educate people on why they use it, when to use it. So they'll go into like a strength trainer or a strongman session and they're wearing something that's monitoring their energy expenditure when that's not the aim of the session itself and it's like it's it really pisses me off because that brings in money that brings in likes that brings in more people but all you're doing is kind of feeding the horse and it's not going to get any better if everywhere replicates that and continues it and I know like there's you know there's loads of like franchises that still continue to do that and like the fitness industry has just kind of gone full circle with it and you're like how can What's the name is it f f45 yeah f45 yeah. is spring in all the cities are springing yeah. up everywhere and that's that's literally that model it's getting small group training it's hit they stick you on basically a cookie cutter nutrition plan so they'll give you your macros and then it's like right just eat this but you're going to do this for six weeks and we're going to get amazing before and afters because you you can't drink you can't do this you can't do that but it's only six weeks so mm -hmm. it's only a short term and then you'll have banging after photos and so people do it but as you said they they don't get educated on the fact that right you eat in single ingredient foods like have some balance if you want to go out for a drink with your mates that's fine but bang some calories like the sort of stuff that we teach is about that longevity it's about we can get you results but you don't have to grind yourself into the ground. And as you said, I think it's just, it's society as a whole is everyone wants results now and they want them quick and they want them guaranteed. And it's just, it's one of those things where we can give you results now and not guaranteed and you don't learn anything. Will you keep them? No, you won't because you haven't learned anything. You're either on plan or off plan. Yeah, it's like, I'll get back on it on Monday. Yeah, and it's I, like I, I'm just like, are we still there? You know, like when I've sent you guys, I'm like, really, are we still having these same conversations? And unfortunately, kind of what we're trying to put forward through the coaching and the group based support, it's not sexy. Like, we we can't kind of like sex it up because it's not, but it fuck it, it works. Like, and people learn. Yeah, right, and people yeah. have gone away from the challenge and continue to put into practice the habits that they've developed and are getting like the best results, feel confident, feel comfortable for like a, a small investment, um, like even financially because they've learned and, you know, like they're the people who are always going to be able to continue with it. But unfortunately, like it, it, it's not sexy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not, it, yeah, I, I, it's not, but like, I think even if you approach these eight week challenges, you can certainly get, you know, six to 10 kilos of fat loss in that time, running a, you know, a decent deficit without killing yourself if it's done in the right way. But I guess what we're trying to teach people in these challenges is, or challenges or transformations, however you want to call it, is 
you can get these results quick do it this way but we're like do it this way but don't add anything in or don't do this or don't skip meals do it exactly as we say and it will still happen and it's trying to educate people that look put your calories slightly higher don't do cardio all the time train hard and heavy for to you know for potentially five times a week and look your results your results will still come and then it's almost like when that happens people are like I've only lost a, you know, half a kilo. I've only lost a kilo this week. And it's like, dude, like, that's amazing. If you lost, you look at, look at Don, he lost half a kilo every week for the last 10 months. And he's, you know, he's fucking treaded now. Like, <laughs> you just keep stacking those on top of each other. Don't kill yourself. That's where you get to. It's like, um, you know, I got a degree and it was fucking the hardest thing. One of the hardest things I've ever done because I'm not academic like that at all. And I got it. And I was like, oh shit, it was just built on doing little bits all the time just just getting done before you know it well it took a long time because i took longer to do it but it, you get there it's like building for me a 300 kilo deadlift it didn't just happen overnight you just have to chip all the time you have to add you know 5k here you know two and a half kilos here if you can add all those on over all you know years well, fucking decades then that's when you get truly strong but along that process you'll still get in phenomenal shape very quickly you just have to keep going but i could i'd you know say i could get anyone in incredible shape within three to six months i say six months for most people if they literally did everything you asked nailed it you can get in a unreal shape in six months you know especially if you've been training for a little while anyway like absolutely you could but yeah. just off the back of but like what we do and what you just said there, Dan, is like the calorie side of things. I mean, how many of outside of the challenge of transformations, how many females have you worked with where straight away you've asked them what the calorie intake is and it's always been like 1,200 calories. That seems to be like magic number diet. And you're like, no, this is what you should be having. And they're so reluctant. Like there's so much more education needs to be put into that because as men, you you as when you were younger, you didn't have magazines on the shelves saying, um, eat this 1200 calorie diet, blah, blah, like just plot it in front of your face. It's a very different marketing that you've been subjected to. So it's kind of not brainwashing. It becomes instilled in you that this is the magic number. This is what you should aim to. This is going to give you the answer. And it's not like, it's not as a sort of a population female, it's not our fault. It is the fucking media. But it's also, as you know more, you then get to have that say in what you want to apply to yourself. And at the end of the day, like you, you are like your own scientific experiment. All you do is kind of use tools and knowledge and education, try things out on yourself. And if they don't work, just change them. It's not like you have to, you today are, are very different to you tomorrow in a week, in a month. In, like, we are in control of like the changes we can make to ourselves. And that's what's so interesting fascinating like don you've decided to go ahead with this comp nobody's made you like you've volunteered to go through it like a period of surplus and then a hefty period of dieting for this is going to sound so shit and i, I do not mean it this okay. way, but like yeah. a, a fucking trophy like yeah. literally to an outsider that's what it looks like but it, it's not that at all that's what it looks like but it's you know we've gone through it like before just like what that teaches you about yourself but it just proves that you have the say in the control it's the application of the actions like that you choose to implement but again yeah. if you don't want to you could turn around tomorrow and say i don't want to do this anymore and you don't have to yeah. answer to anyone because it's your body and it's your choice yeah 100 percent. and as you said it's it's a choice like i put something out on um social media the other day and it was about it was a very short story about my dog and if she got overweight because I've overfed her the advice that would be given to her it's very very simple because it's energy in versus energy out now I then got some interesting kind of comments back where it was just like yeah but what about this and what about that and what about this whether it's like family or social pressures or trigger foods or this or that and it was just like yeah you make a great point those are all things that can affect the journey from a personal point of view I also have those things I have a family who don't want to diet I have junk food in the cupboard over there that I could quite easily go and eat like 5,000 calories worth of food right now if I wanted to but it's a choice 
the job that you do, if it is like unsocial hours and long like shifts and things like that, that they're, they're all choices, whether they're conscious or subconscious or whether you feel trapped within that choice now, it is still a choice. Every single day that you wake up and go to work is a choice. You could choose not to go, but then you won't get paid. So it, it's one of those things where we, we live in a free country we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of choice, but we don't have freedom from consequences. All of our choices have repercussions. And as adults, we have to take responsibility for those. Like the, the people that frustrate me as a coach are the ones that offload that responsibility onto somebody else. They'll say things like, I don't have time or... Um, I think the best one is, oh, I'm not a PT like you. I can't spend all my life in the gym. Like, that's my favorite one because it's just like, you, you've you clearly never run a business before. We we don't, like, just spend all day lifting weights and then people just pay us to do that. That's, that's a professional bodybuilder. Like, that's a professional athlete. When we're not professional athletes, we have just as much time demands as kind of like anyone else. We just understand that self-care is very very important if you you can't pour from an empty cup if you aren't watching kind of like what you eat so you're not eating mcdonald's five days a week if you're not making sure you get enough water if you're not getting enough sleep that your energy levels are going to be in the toilet so how can you as a health professional teach others to have a better healthier quality of life if you're then not able to do those things yourself. I think I heard, I can't remember which um, guy it was on Instagram was like, you, these um, PTs that are out there and they're, they're trying to teach others to get their shit together, but they don't have their own shit together. And I think that's why there's there's such a, a negative connotation when it comes to the word personal trainer, because there's such a low barrier to this industry. There's that, all you have to do is walk into your local like pure gym and look at the quality of the trainers there. Now, I'm not knocking trainers in like budget gyms. Like I'm sure there is some lovely ones that get great results, but there's also a lot of crap ones. Like I'm sure you guys have worked with some of them as well. Like there's some horrendous stories that I've seen. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some bad changes. There's some coaches out there, but I mean, we, we live in an age when anyone can be a coach in anything they want. Um, and you can choose to view that as uh what the fuck get a real job or the other way to look at it is shit someone has literally dedicated their life to learning about this whether it's you know how to fix your car or tr personal train or you know mental health uh, not mental health but more like um well-being you know all that kind of stuff there's there's a coach for everything going and it does get a bit diluted but at the same time you can look at it is someone who has dedicated their life, their experiences, what they do every day into being a professional and helping other people with what they want to achieve. So, you know, I need help with my taxes. I pay an accountant to do that for me. Um, you know, if I want to get something done on my house, yes, I could do it myself or I could pay a tradesman, you know, a decent amount of money and they would do it fantastically. I think it's the same thing when it comes down to a coach. Um, with fat loss muscle gain or um you know physical problems you have there are people out there now who are, that are becoming that specialized in an area that you need help with that their job is to help you with that so when it comes to coaching yes there's a low barrier to entry but at the same time there are some phenomenal minds and people in the industry who you know i've paid and i know rachel's paid and i'm i know i think they're pretty sure don spent a decent amount of money into it. we're talking thousands actually when i think about it on my head go fucking yeah thousands and i will continue yeah. to spend money into it for people to help you with one thing like you know <laughs> I, you know i'll travel you know around the northeast to, to speak to people well probably the country but nationwide to speak to about squat bench deadlift like literally three lifts i will travel around to talk to people uh, who are specialized in that who spend their life there we're talking people like phd level in squat bench deadlift or you know body composition change there are experts in that field that can help you in the way you want so you know 
you can give them some money they can tell you what you want you get something from it you learn a bit more you can now get some more knowledge and um to me that's quite a worthwhile transaction but yeah it's, it's a weird industry but i do think it's developing more and i think i'm, I'm of the opinion now um you know it, isn't it great that there's these people out there that can help you with something you want to do? If you need help with your meditation, you go speak to someone that can help you. And if it makes your life feel 10 times better and you feel you've got loads of value from it, what's the problem? I think it's great. Yeah. Well, we all invest in coaching. We all invest in education. Like we, we know the benefit of decreasing the learning curve. Like there's whatever you want to learn now because of the internet, you can find that information at your fingertips. You just type it into Google and you'll find a thousand articles on whatever niche subject you have. The problem is trying to learn things like lifting weights, like fat loss, like um, muscle building from books is very, very hard because there's so many different theories and they all work to one degree or another if you follow the basic principles of progressive overload and um basically having enough protein um pretty much whatever training modality you will you do if as long as it is uh, as long as it is progressive in nature will work to do something whether that something helps you or brings you further away from the goal that you've got in your mind you'll only find out by kind of trial and error basically and the thing about having a coach is that I don't know about you guys but I've tried probably 20 to 30 different training programs written by other people I've now had three or four different coaches and each one of those has got a slightly different way like all my coaches have been bodybuilding coaches, but they all coach it in a slightly different way. And I've picked up bits of information from every single one of them. And I can now say if somebody comes to me and they've got a particular problem that I've probably dealt with the majority of problems that come, with my, come my way now, because I've been in this industry for nearly 10 years. So you're benefiting from the fact that I, I've got 10 years of experience. I've worked with hundreds of clients now, which means that when you come to me with that problem, I've probably seen it before. And I've probably tried a few different things that have worked or haven't worked. And therefore I may have some suggestions that you've not thought of. Something simple like, um, I put something out on my Instagram the other day on a poll. And somebody said they were struggling with their nutrition. We got talking and they were like, oh, I just, I don't have time to prep food i was like okay uh, who cooks the evening meals in your house he's like well i do it's like okay how much harder do you think it would be to cook six portions rather than four like well, it's not really that much harder you just have the extra ingredients in okay so if you're cooking four cook six and just plate two up and stick them in a tupperware tub and that's your food prep like it's no extra time it's no extra effort you're already cooking that meal just cook an extra two it's like, oh i never thought of that but that's the benefit is that we've seen somebody with that problem and that's the solution we've kind of, we've given them. So you're benefiting from somebody else's experience of having solved the problems that you've got before you've even got them, which means you don't then have to spend however long doing the research, trying to figure out how to get past the problem that you've got. That kind of makes sense. I don't know, I've waffled on a little bit there. In, like one of the problems is like we've seen it in obviously when we've done polls or people have asked questions in the home gym group um is that uh, often people will kind of let one bad experience of working with the coach or a pt tarnish kind of all coaches all pts whereas if you got somebody in who wired up um like the mains on your new cougar just got a new cougar um and there was an issue with that you wouldn't go right all electricians are fucking shit like None, none of them can do the job I'm never going to do that again I need to learn it and do it all myself yet then we apply it to kind of the coaching and PT world and you go okay well that's nonsensical yet this makes sense to certain people and everyone is because they've had that one bad experience no one can provide them with what they need whereas 
even if somebody gave you a good service, it still doesn't mean that they're the best fit for you at that time with what you want to do with your training, your nutrition, what you want to develop from like a lifestyle perspective. And like I've worked with different coaches for very different reasons in the past and I've learned different things from all of them. And I'd like to think that when I do a mentorship, um, I'll then feed that into the service I've got. So my clients benefit from my financial and time investment because they get the better service like whenever they're working with me and then into the future because that's the whole point. It's you don't learn to learn, you learn to apply. And that's always something I've kind of looked for in coaches that I'll work with. Like, who have you learned this from? Like, or who would you recommend for me to learn from as well? Like, what do you read? Because I want to kind of see what their level of investment is. And like, just coming from the education sector, you kind of look at things from like a lifelong learning perspective, because the minute you stop learning is the minute you get left behind. And, you know, people become bitter. We've seen that in the industry, people become bitter. And as they get older, because there are newer, younger coaches coming along who know more and are getting better results because they're kind of more up to speed with newer technologies, newer studies, different ways of doing it. Like even looking at like the bro diet inside of things versus flexible diet. And like, that's just one well-known example. Um, and it's that sort of thing. It's like, well, where, where do you as a coach spend your time and money? Are your clients seeing the benefit of that? Otherwise, what are you learning for if it's not being used? Yeah. Dan, what do you, like, you, you mentioned before that, like, academia was never kind of, like, your strong suit, but you, you pushed yourself to kind of get a degree. Do you find that you like hungrier to like learn like now now that you're an adult now you're not being forced to and like you can pick the subject so like one thing I struggled with at school is I wasn't in charge of my own education journey somebody just plonked it on me and we've got to learn, learn English math science like I did all right but I wasn't passionate about it I didn't want to pick up a book on it whereas actually I can sit and scroll on my phone and like somebody will post an article about like training and I'll go and read it. No, I don't need to. That's my, that's my time. Like, but I'm spending it reading articles about like training methods or diets or things like that. Do you, do you find that because you're in charge of your education now that like you, um, you want to do it, you, you choose to do it rather than being forced to do it? Yeah. Good question. I mean, I um, only pursue things really that I, you know, passion's a good word that I'm interested in. So I've got a bit of an, obs- I've got, I have an obsessive um, personality with certain things. So for example, training rugby, what well, it was rugby, not so much now, a little bit. Rugby, training, drums, music, steak. Um, steak. Yeah, no, barbecue as well. I get like, balls deep into the topic for example when my back went I, I literally only wanted to know about backs That's all I did for about a year or two um to the point that it was like it was ridiculous like I, I was only obsessed with back training but how to fix your back how to do this how to do that why do backs happen you know that's all I wanted to do then I hurt my knee recently so I was like okay well let's go smash into knee training so I'm kind of more of my lessons I guess it's a good thing I'm getting older a lot of what I share with people is kind of my own experiences I'm, I'm quite a big almost like an evidence-based bro if you get me like I'm not super I am I think anyone says a super evidence-based is a bit of a liar unless they can back it up with citations and abs- uh, studies like we'll just clear this up with was like you're not evidence-based if you follow Lane Norton and can quote an abstract. If you've read an abstract from Brad Schoenfeld, you're not an evidence-based trainer. You think you are, but you're not. Have you spent time sitting there, reading it, studying it? Like, you know, like you did with your um, sports science degree. Like, have you actually sat there, really gone through it? Then you can call yourself an evidence-based trainer. But if you don't do that, I'm sorry, you're not. And like, I'm not, you know, <laughs> like the, the kind of way we, do, we talk about trades and stuff is literally what did Kelly Stewart do? Everyone talk about him, let's do that. What did Scott University do? Every Sunday, everyone's recommend that. What does the knees over ties to toes guy do, right? Everyone recommends that. It's like, I mean, that's fine to share the message. Like there's some great stuff there, but don't pretend you're evidence-based because you follow evidence-based people. Um, so I've had that big sort of realization that I'm sort of 
strongly guided by evidence. You know, I love the evidence-based, you know, guys like Eric Holmes and Brad Schoenfels and Brett Contreras, those kind of guys. You know, Jeff Nippard, I think, is doing an amazing job on YouTube sort of sharing evidence-based trainers, um, the methods and things with uh, a wider audience. But, you know, a lot of mine is experience. I will go with things if, like, if it feels pretty good, then, okay, we'll work with that, you know. A lot of the time with stuff that's coming out with through studies is stuff bodybuilders or powerlifters have been preaching for years like literally years and years and years yes they might be a very specific example but there is some merit to what they do like it's it, it's i think one of the skills i've learned is being able to pick different things from different people and know you know even if maybe i don't like them personally or you know can fully really get behind what they do there's some elements from there I go, oh that's pretty cool I can, I can see the merit in that and there's some things i'm like do you know what that just gets me excited so you know if, if benching with chains makes me excited about training then fuck i'm gonna do it like there's there's you know there's, there's lots of things to pick out from people. I mean, the one that people love bashing West Side now. I, I could talk about strength training and stuff, like examples. And people, people now love bashing Stu McGill as well, and a lot of the spine stuff. It's almost like the fun thing to do because there's been like one study that says, oh, actually, this might not be the right thing, you know? So it's almost like cherry picks. But then there's like a hundred other that says it's great. Like, well, what you've got to do is you've got to look at the results. At the end of the yeah, day, yeah, it's success I, leaves clues. I think. I mean, yeah. there might be a lot of people that maybe got chewed up and spit out by it, but at the same time, have you sat down in a room with this person and sat with them and talked? Like, do you remember Charles Pollock when we were younger was like the, the guru, like the build and end, where everyone loved everything about him, and then suddenly it switched to everyone saying he's a joke and this is rubbish and all that. And now it's come back. Like a video came up to him the other day about how he would coach his athlete who was a, I think she was a Highland Games athlete. It's on Ed Cohen's channel, and um, she had cancer when she trained with him, and she fucking won the Highland Games. It was incredible but the way he was talking about training it was basically before it became a thing it was um what do you call it a reactive training or what's that, what do you call it um auto regulated auto training it was essentially that that's exactly what it was but it wasn't called auto regulated training and it hasn't been backed up by science maybe at that point but he already knew like okay your back's fucked from doing this all day right we'll train your arms today and then we'll go do this tomorrow he just kind of knew the yeah. things like that and it's like I think there's still a lot to learn from those kind of guys, which people said are all bollocks and made stuff up. Yeah, there might be some completely made up shit, you know, like when he's like, you know, jabbing people's ears and random stuff and don't eat carbs and all that. But at the same time, you know, I think it's just not being stuck to, to one training modality. Like, like as you yeah. said, people will, will read and then like that is their guru. And it's a case of, well, you aren't an educator or a coach all you're doing is copying somebody else's practice and you don't actually understand it because you haven't created it yourself you replicate it but you work with individuals who are physiologically different every day so you can't just apply that like the auto regulation stuff like i love that because for me like with the height mobility like that's always how i have to approach things mm -hmm. because i'm a pelvic health client that's how we have to approach things when we're looking at um menstrual symptoms we're looking at flare-ups of like prolapse symptoms but then when you also you then look at the other side and you're looking at your strength athletes who are competing in a matter of weeks you can't apply auto regulation because they've got numbers to hit like that is not going to work no matter how fucked they are like you can't change what those numbers need to be kind of across that week and the next week you might be able to approach how you're going to get there by changing sort of your sets and reps around but you can't auto regulate in terms of going this week I think we need to deload like um deadlift because we don't have that time to play with but that again comes with experience and trying things out yourself because you you know yourself that like you'll have a good run of training like for me and then something will happen I'm fucked like and then I have to completely change what I'm doing and it might be like completely switching things up but it, again it's from that education standpoint and if you don't understand the reasons behind why things are happening or have happened then all you're going to do is repeat the same thing which is just madness so it's it's a learning curve but also a learning curve with yourself and your clients yeah I, th I think, think it's interesting you mentioned the stuff about the numbers like I think you can change it Rich like I say this as like coaching myself in the last couple of meets. Uh, there were times I should have changed it. Like I know I had to squat 200 for, I don't know, eight that day. 
and I would do anything to get there and push it. But I think in reality, it would have been better to maybe keep the same weight and do just a few less reps or slightly change it and things. And I think when, when competitions come around, there is that pressure to, to hit it. But like I've heard a few stories of people like completely backing off and then still hitting PBs as they get yeah. there. But I, think you've mentally, just got to take, like, I don't think I could mentally. I, need, I would need someone to do that for me. Because yeah. that would really set my mind in a spiral getting close to a comp knowing I haven't touched what I need to do and I would need someone almost in the like well funny enough a coach to say well, <laughs> that. why don't we look past this meet you know we could do another one in a few months when you're feeling better because like, we've all had it when for some reason or another you've uh, you know going into a strongman competition or a bodybuilding show whatever you've done everything right you've tried to do exactly the training you've, you've read it all for some reason a lift feels off or for some reason, you know, like, you know, you have trouble with your lower back. For some reason, it's not coming in. It's like, it's so frustrating. You're like, I've literally done everything perfectly. But then come next comp, something's like, oh, the squat feels really good now. My dead feels really good. It's like, I've literally not changed anything volume-wise, lifestyle factors. Like, you, you try your best as a coach to make sure you can be in charge and, and on top of those things. But sometimes it just kind of, hey, how it happens. And that's, that's kind of why RP, the RPE scale was born out of, because sometimes shit just happens like yeah. I remember what's the name to share was saying he basically did it because he did the, the singles the, the stuff that he brings up where you do an rpa at the beginning of training because he just went to a meet he had, he said to that you he had no right to deadlift what he did that day and then he did it i think something like 360 plus which i think was an american record he was like i had no right to do that it just felt good and it was just like sometimes that happens as well i think that's like knowing yourself though, but also knowing your clients like for some clients, you can't give them that because you know that's going to just have such a detrimental effect to the next sessions. But some who know themselves really well, you're like, if it's there, take it because they're, like, they're having a good streak, everything's where it should be. And why would you hinder progress when it's there to be banked sooner? It might mean that you need to like bring your day load forward or change your later planning. But again, if it's there, and even from a like, recovery standpoint, if it's there, like these are things to like bank as and when you can. Hmm. Yeah, definitely banking. I think um, it's a good point. Oh, I'm starting to zone out. I think I need him. It's so fucking gaunt. He looks like a skeleton, doesn't he? What you gotta do is just, Mate, do, just I, can't, do the... I can't wait to be on like plus four thousand calories again. Like it feels I I can't remember the last time I felt full. Like I genuinely can't remember the last time I felt full. It's it's one of those where this part now, it's 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 all up here. It's ignoring those signals. Bodies that I can't sleep like because my body's just in fight or flight mode like all the time. I'll literally just be laid there like you know. Normally, if you can't sleep, it's because your mind's buzzing. You just laid there and you're just like fucking hungry <laughs> that's all i can think is yeah. i'm so bloody hungry if i don't go to sleep soon i'm gonna need to get up to go to the toilet because i'm weeing every 45 minutes when i'm awake why can't i go to sleep like oh like it, what's your last meal at the minute Pardon? what's last your last meal, meal at the minute uh, about 150 grams of greek yogurt with um some whey protein mixed in and a single piece of dark chocolate a single piece of dark single chocolate. piece of dark chocolate it used to be two and now it's down to one <laughs> it makes me very mate, sad <laughs> you do look you look phenomenal though mate i mean how, how are you feeling about your physique going into it um it's one of those i could probably do with another two weeks ideally however um, I don't mind going in. I reckon out of the, if like 100% was like absolutely shredded to the bone, nothing more could come off without sacrificing muscle mass. I reckon I'll probably be about 90% of the way there. Um, so like, as I was saying before, like my lower back starting to come in now, which is the last two bits for me to come in is my lower back and then my glutes, like, getting straight to glutes is like what you want in terms of bodybuilding levels of condition, just cause like on the natural side of it, all you've got is 
like just coming in in freaky levels of condition nowadays. Um, so I've got this first one on September 18th, I believe it is. And then there is either another one on the 31st of September or the 6th of November, I think it is. So I'll, I'll pick um, one from either of those. Um, but yeah, it'll be good. It's been pretty, it's the same competition. So it'll be two years exactly between the last time when I stepped on stage and, and this oh, time oh, kind of oh. stepping on stage. So it'll be interesting to see the progress that I've made. Um, I'll actually be able to put like the photos kind of like next to each other. I know my body much better this time as well. So I know I spilled over. So for those that don't understand um, bodybuilding, when you carb up, there's, there's three things you'll often hear bodybuilders talk about, which is being flat, being full and being spilled. So being flat is when you've been basically depleting your body of glycogen for a period of time and the muscles will appear flat. Um, because there's the glycogen and the water basically drains out of them and you you just look it's almost like a, if you took a balloon underneath and deflated it that's what your muscle kind of like looks like being full is when you will eat a carbohydrate based meal you get all the water and the glycogen go in and the muscle fills out against the skin and the skin looks like paper thin so that's the ideal look you want on competition days and you've stripped all the body fat away and then you fill up the muscles and like that's kind of like what you're trying to do when you spill is when you then eat too much glycogen too much carbs the carbohydrate basically spills out of the muscle and gets trapped between uh the skin and the um the fat and it goes it makes your skin look watery which is when people say that you look soft on stage now in the assisted side, that's where people use diuretics and stuff like that. But at large, you can really, really mess with stuff. I'm not going to mess with my sodium content this time because I I messed it up last time. And as I said, I look soft as hell. Um, are you doing like a mock carb up at all? Or are you just going off what you know about your body and just running it as you would like on show day? I'm going to speak to Jake about it. I think we're going to try rather than what's it called? Um, front loading so Lane Norton uh, talks about front loading on peak week rather than the more traditional one which is basically you carb up like the day before so you have like your heavy carb meal at the beginning of the week when training and stuff's still in there so then if you spill you've got a couple of days to like sort it out whereas when you try and carb up like the day before if you get it slightly wrong there's not really a lot you can do in those kind of like hours before you're pretty screwed so yeah, that's where's something... you like to pop it up if you need to yeah so it's one of those things where we're gonna i'm gonna speak to jake and I'm, i want to try that this time so carb up at the beginning of the week taper it back off to like a normal level of carbs as you're bringing your cardio and stuff and the stress from everything kind of like down and then it just means that, as you said, if I need to top it up, I know I can add an extra 50 grams of carbs in that day before if it needs it. Whereas if you're coming in from really flat, like people do like depletion models and stuff like the week before, like I'm not a 300 pound bodybuilder that needs a thousand grams to carb up. Like your natural side of it, you need like 200 grams of carbohydrates to fill up. So I think that's the mistake a lot of natural guys make as well is they they take their peak week protocols from professional bodybuilders. So my stage weight at well, I don't know what about 70 kilos. So what's that? 140 pounds ish? Something around there? I don't know. Um I, I don't deal with freedom units. Well, the uh, if you look at a professional assisted bodybuilder. They might be 240, 250 pounds. That's 100 pounds of muscle. Like, that, that's going to need a lot more carbs in there to fill that up. Like, because at the end of the day, skeleton's going to weigh the same. Your organs are pretty much going to weigh the same. Like, the difference between the two is, is pretty much going to be muscle. So, yeah, it should be fun. So, if anybody wants to come down and watch a load of men in their posing thongs in rugby on the 18th of September, Drop me a DM. I'll pin you across the tickets. I might put, I don't know if I'll put the tickets thing into the 
think. I need to just buy know. some for friends and family first before I put it out there. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll get people, but it kind of sounds like when you're going through your show that you don't want to be thumbing in a softy, you want to be going in nice and hard, right? Mm. I think that's life. just a, a metaphor for life, to be honest. I, I think so. <laughs> don't, 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 I'm going to softy, nice and hard is what you do. <laughs> and I think that's probably where we should leave it. So, been great to catch well, that's, 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 yeah. that's going to be the uh, the one liner for Ben. Um, <laughs> been great to catch up with you both. Uh, looking forward to having some energy back in a few weeks. Um, and yeah, so next week we will hopefully have a guest. I'm not going to say who it is now, just in case it doesn't happen. But hopefully next week we'll have a guest. We've got a number of guests lined up over the next few weeks. We're going to try and get some. Um, kit manufacturers in as well as other athletes etc so yeah it's going to be good to be uh speaking to some different some uh new faces i know i've known dan and rach and myself always get a lot when we kind of bring a guest on because awesome. we do it for selfish reasons as just as much as anything we want to learn from them so uh guys dan where can the people find you if they want to get to know you and your content a little bit better in the toilet hiding from a toddler uh, <laughs> or on Facebook, Dan Frazier or Barbers and Beans on Instagram. And yourself, Rachel? Um, Instagram at rs underscore strength underscore coach. Perfect. And I am at DGPT on both uh, Instagram and Facebook. So been great to catch up, guys. I will speak to you both soon. And to our tens of listeners, uh, it's been wonderful to get back to you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, Dan. See you later, Dan. All right. Bye. See you, mate.